Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This time I will call the Pawnee County Board of Commissioners work session of January 28th, 2020, to order. And ask Brian if you bring uh, forward the list. We'd uh, like to recognize elected person there, Sheriff Gary Gulledge, with a nice haircut, by the way. <laughs> Colonel Hutton uh, had him get that kind of haircut, right, Colonel? Yes. All right. Um, if you still got your phone on, it'd be a good time to turn that off. And we're so honored and privileged to have Miss Becky Shaley with us this morning, the senior leader of Firestarter Ministries and International, to bring us our invocation and lead us in the pledge. Stand if you're able. And if I may, Chairman Carmichael, before I pray, to invite everyone to join us at 1 o'clock in the pavilion outside. The Pauling Ministerial Association, beginning this month, is hosting um, community prayer gatherings, and we're beginning with our county government. So we'd love to have all of you join us at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today acknowledging, as King David did, that yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. O oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to come publicly to pray for our government leaders, for our military service men and women, for all first responders, and every one of their precious families. I pray, Father, for protection, for strength, for health, for abundant grace and great wisdom, for them to be able to carry out the tasks set before them to serve, defend, and protect each one of us. Father, in this new year of 2020, we ask that you grant our commissioners 2020 vision to see clearly what you would have them do. Grant them peace, grace, and wisdom that will empower them to accomplish all that you have for them to do in this county. Help them, Father, to remember that the weight of this government does not rest on their shoulders, but it rests on you. And may they always seek your plans and purposes for this great county of Paulding. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pastor Shaley, thank you for that beautiful start to this meeting. The January 14th, 2020 work session minutes and the January 14th board meeting minutes are available for review. Our Positively Paulding segment this morning recognizes Mr. Corporal Mike Ellison. Uh, who has the job of keeping the Silver Comet Trail safe. So let's watch that together. In the fall of 2019, Runner's World Magazine contacted us at the Paulding County Sheriff's Office about doing an article on the Silver Comet Trail. Specifically, they wanted to know how we kept the Silver Comet Trail safe and what all went into that. Corporal Mike Ellison, who was assigned as a supervisor for the Silver Comet Trail Patrol, was highlighted in their article. Being a veteran deputy with the Paulding County Sheriff's Office, Corporal Mike Ellison always goes above and beyond when he's on duty. Corporal Ellison is an excellent deputy and is the epitome of what a deputy sheriff should be. Every day that he works, he's always out helping the public, making sure to keep our trails safe. Having deputies out on the trail is an extremely valuable asset because it gives the bicyclists and the cyclists and the walkers, gives them the added peace of mind knowing that someone is out there keeping them safe while they're out exercising. Deputies patrol the trail during daylight hours, Monday through Sunday. Whether your bicycle breaks down or you just need a lift, the Paulding County Sheriff's Office always has a deputy out on the Silver Comet Trail. And congratulations to Corporal Mike Ellison, who helps keep one of our most beautiful assets, the Silver Comet Trail, safe every day. Ashley, is uh, Corporal Ellison here? He is, right here. All right. So, so proud of you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, put on your calendar for 
two days from today, Thursday, 11 o'clock, the Costco groundbreaking. Uh, and so grateful to have Steve, Steve Grimsley here and uh, Angela, Angela in the front row that have uh, put that together. And we have a couple of state uh, delegates that will be here along with Costco folks. Uh, so it will be a, a nice short event right there where Costco is going to be located. Um, the Board of Commissioners would like to recognize the fire department's personnel and their instructor on the successful completion of the department's first advanced emergency medical technician program. Chief Pelfrey is going to tell us a little bit more about that. I know y'all see a lot of firemen. I promise there's somebody out there protecting the county. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Commissioner Hart was talking in the hallway. When I started working here, we didn't have this many firemen, so we're very fortunate to have that many. As you know, call volume keeps going up. We've been dispatched over 16,000 calls, and it's, that's up about 7% what we had. Most of our calls, 80% of them are EMS and rescue calls. So we knew we had to do something for retention, and we had a lot of uh, students that were committed to wanting to go to EMT school, but one of the uh, biggest setbacks with that was the cost. It cost about $4,000 to go to EMT school, and the majority of these people are having to pay for it on their own, and they just can't afford it in public safety. So we decided to uh, go to the State Department of Public Health Office of EMS and Trauma and they approved us for a class and uh, we hired us a great instructor lisa lewis and so uh, the class began last may uh, the commissioners were very nice to approve that for us and approve the contracts these young men showed their commitment by signing a contract to come to the school uh, they had to change shifts in order to do this and they had to come to school on their days off time away from their family after working 24-hour shifts but they stayed committed to it they had uh, 262 hours of classroom hours, 78 lab uh, hours of laboratory, and 72 hours of field clinic, basically going out and riding on an ambulance and doing that as well. Uh, like I said, they attended these schools on their day off, and they also did these clinicals on their days off. In uh, September, after going, they started the class in May. In September, they were able to go and take their EMT basic class through the uh, National Registry. Uh, Ms. Lewis, she ran some figures and they said on the statistics that only 70% of uh, students passed that test the first time. We had a 100% pass rate, which uh, is a testament to them and their hard work as well as our instructors. So we're very proud of them for that. Uh, then they continued on. Uh, they're going to the advanced level of EMT and they're getting ready to take that test now and I'm sure they're all going to pass. We're going to have 100% again as well as that. So I'd like to introduce them, and uh, I'm not going to go in order, guys. So I'm going to call your names out and just step forward or raise your hand, okay? All right, Noah Braden, Casey Dearman, Nick Gregory, Sam Mathis, Ray Rockmore, Jonathan Crandall, Jacob Freeman, Joshua Hill, Jeremy Nall, and Spencer West. And of course, you cannot do that without a fantastic instructor, which is what we have. We was fortunate enough to get Lisa Lewis. Lisa's been involved in EMS for over 20 years. I shouldn't say over 20. You don't like that, do you? About 20 years, okay? Uh, she earned her certification EMT in 2004 in paramedic. She also had uh, many additional hours of training and education at the level of critical care paramedic. She began taking part in EMS education in 2012 and she holds an instructor certification through the state of EMS, American Heart Association, and National Association of EMTs. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much, and I think these guys would agree uh, that they would not have been successful without your leadership and, and tutelage, and we really do appreciate it, so thank you. And that's about all I have. I know they want to give her something, and we'll do that outside in the, the hall if you guys want to do that, okay? So thank you all very much. And I'd also like their supervisors to come forward if we can to get pictures.
Good job, guys, and Lisa. Thank you, Chief Pelfrey. Like a bunch of studs to me. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Huh? Okay, for 2020, uh, we're going to begin starting today uh, with four different organizations that are very important to Paulding County. Rotate to ensure that we hear from them at least uh, once every four months. Um, that's going to be the Airport Authority, Executive Director, Stacy Hamby's here, the, the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to hear from the Industrial Building Authority and also uh, the fairly new organization, the Economic Development Organization with its new director, uh, Mr. Michael Hughes. Today, uh, we're starting out with uh, a report on the airport from the airport director, Mr. Terry Tibbetts, and it's rumored that he's celebrating his 39th birthday today. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Terry. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start off by saying what a difference a year makes. And I'm looking forward to giving this presentation. Uh, this, uh, for those of you who have watched me over the, the past almost four years now, I'm coming up on my fourth anniversary in this job, which is pretty unbelievable. This is by far uh, the most pleasurable occasion that I have had to stand before you. I'm going to start off by recognizing my staff. Uh, Yolanda and Randy, I'll stand up right quick. Uh, the three of us run one of the largest industrial complexes in North Georgia known as the Paulden Northwest Atlanta Airport and it's a handful and I could not do it. Y'all can sit down now, that's enough. Um, I could not do it without these folks, the first responders, everybody in the county has been so helpful uh, to us. This, this is an important piece of infrastructure for the county. I hope you'll uh, see that coming forward as I give this presentation. Uh, Frank has given me five minutes, so I'm going to do the best I can, Frank, but i got a lot to say. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is there's a lot of confusion about who the Paulding, um, Paulding County Airport Authority is. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that the Paulding County Airport Authority is a public entity. It is a part of government. It is, it is a political subdivision of the state of Georgia. Uh, this is the 1972 law that enacted the existence of the Paulding County Airport Authority. Uh, the authority of, is made up of this group. Some people complain that there should be elected officials on it. Well, there are. There are three. The mayors of Hiram and Dallas, your chairman, uh, Chairman Carmichael, and the other folks that you see there. Um, what a great group this is. They have just been so supportive um, and have hung in there together as we have moved forward uh, and and tried to make this uh, a very useful asset for Paulding County. When you have a staff of three trying to do the job that we do, you have to be very versatile. Uh, so this is an example of Randy doing his best men in black imitation and elf on a shelf, and he covers everything in between. Yolanda calls him the, the ninja. Um, he's everywhere, he does everything. His official title is Director of Maintenance. Um, Yolanda always embarrasses me because every time I ask her to do something, she says, well, I did that yesterday. Um, so she's always a step ahead of me. These folks are just great. All right, let's go ahead and, and talk about the elephant in the room, uh, commercialization. Commercialization of the Paulden Northwest Atlanta Airport has been the most divisive issue for the past 100 years in this county. I think everybody in here would probably agree with that statement. Um, the uh, commercialization began in 2012, and what I can say with absolute certainty is now it's over. So I'll bring you up to speed on where we are in, in this um, experiment to commercialize the Paulden Northwest Atlanta Airport. 
uh, in December of 2018, just before the start of last year, Silver Comet, uh, Silver Comet Terminal Partners failed to exercise their right to expand into the entire terminal building, which opened up um, an exit uh, window for the Paulden uh, Airport Authority, which we exercised in that same month and voted unanimous, unanimously in accordance with the contract to terminate the commercial uh, contract with Silver Comet Terminal Partners. And the last bullet there is the key bullet. All efforts to commercialize the Paulden Northwest Atlanta Airport have now ended. So we are running one of the finest general aviation airports in our region. Uh, we believe it has more potential than probably any airport in the state. And you're going to see what we've been able to accomplish in the last 12 months. We began the year with the official name on the marquee sign as Silver Comet Field. Uh, that was in recognition of the commercialization uh, attempt with Silver Comet Terminal Partners. My board voted unanimously to change the name back to the Paulden Northwest Atlanta Airport, which was the official name of the airport, always had been, always was. Uh, that is the name by which the um, FAA recognizes us, and we felt that the marquee sign out front and all of our marketing materials uh, and logos should say, should reflect the name Paulden County. We're proud of that name, and that's what we wanted. Now, the reason I put this sign up here, or this picture up here, is I want y'all to recognize how big things are uh, when you drive past them uh, down the side of the road. My wife has been after me to, to start a diet for I don't know how long, and I have found the perfect diet. I'm just going to stand on the side of the road, and as you drive by, I'm going to look half the size that I really am. <laughs> But this is what the sign looks like today. Um, FL Graphics did a great job of, of painting and, uh, and rebranding the sign. Uh, we think that it's uh, a beautiful reflection of our county and the airport that we have. Um, we have, as I said, we've made that change throughout the building. And as you come in from the airfield, this is the first thing you see when you enter the terminal. So let's talk about the infrastructure improvements for the year. We started out the year 2019 as an R2 zoning. And so I decided I could either go buy a bunch of goats and plant a garden, or we could do the right thing and rezone our airport light industrial, which is what it really is. Uh, we had to go through the exact same procedure uh, that any other landowner would go through. We properly noticed, advertised, uh, went before the zoning board, came before you, and y'all voted to uh, rezone the Paulding County Airport as a light industrial uh, piece of property. Y'all know that governments are exempt from their own zoning rules, but we felt it was important to lead by example, and this will be a benefit to the surrounding landowners so that the land use is reflected in the zoning that the airport holds. Um, if you look in the center of the picture there, you'll see why having a field fence around the airport is important. We received a $375,000 grant from Georgia DOT to construct four and a half miles of wildlife fencing, and that has now been complete, and Bambi now has to stand on the outside and look in, which increases the safety of operations at the airport considerably. The airfield uh, is now almost 11 years old. The painting had become dim, uh, just like with interstate highways, any highways, you have to keep your pavement markings refreshed. We received in 2019 $150,000 grant from the FAA to remark the airfield. And so from the air, this is what the airfield now looks like. You can read the uh, markings on the landing strip from 10 miles away. Uh, this is, again, a great improvement to the safety and the operation of the airport, and we're very thankful to the FAA for that grant. Uh, if you look very carefully, you'll see something different about our corporate hangar. You see this little line right here, and you see this funny looking door on the outside. This is what I came to y'all in April of last year asking for funding for. Uh, you not only provided funding, but through the leadership of Commissioner Stover, you also opened up the county procurement system to us. You gave us the county engineer uh, to handle uh, the project, and the county saved over $160,000 in the construction of this project. This is what it looks like open. Uh, this is the large side of the hangar. We can now place an airplane in here fully fueled in full compliance with all federal, state, international fire codes that has a wingspan of over 100 feet. So this is a great benefit to the airport and the tax base of Paulding County. Uh, we were also able during the year to relocate our office space. 
I used to have a wonderful view of a dirt pile in a parking lot out my window, and I could not see what was going on on the airfield. We have now moved to the other side of the terminal building, and I can see the entire airfield, air operations, ground operations, maintenance, and any construction jobs that we've got going on. So let's talk about maintenance. Uh, this is the window that I can now look out, out of, one of the windows, and I can see 100 acres of grass. I can see thousands of lights, and you can see there some of the light bulbs are pretty big. Airports are big things. We have over six miles of service roads. We have now five over five miles of fencing, 75,000 square feet of buildings, acres of concrete, large detention ponds, miles of storm drains, large uh, emergency generators. Again, go back to the aerial picture here. You can see our service roads extending around the peripheral. Keep in mind that from this line to this line is over a mile. So from this service road to the one that you can't see on the bottom of this picture is over a mile and a half. Um, and from this extreme to this extreme in some places is as much as half a mile. So, and in some cases we have two service roads. There's actually a service road that runs parallel but behind uh, all of the infrastructure of the actual airfield so that we can get to every inch of the airport and keep it maintained, inspected, uh, and the things that we have to do on the airfield. Economic development. The airport is a major component of economic development in Paulding County. This is a picture that we took the night of the Super Bowl. On that night, we had a dozen large jets, this size and, and larger, parked out in front of the tarmac um, that was carrying corporations uh, and patrons to the game that was held in downtown Atlanta. Uh, these folks drive rental cars, uh, they stay in hotels, they eat food, but more importantly, they were, they were given a very good taste of hospitality that Paulding County has to offer. And we feel that that's an important uh, first introduction to the county when folks fly into the Paulding County Airport. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about this picture. If you count them, you will see that there are five corporate jets that carried on this particular day about 50 executives. What were they here for? You may be aware that Walmart has just opened the prototype for the entire United States, um, a, a uh, clinic um, for a new way of doing business uh, to treat uh, patients and our community. And by having our airport located about 15 minutes away by car, uh, they could have a waiting car um, for their airplane as they landed, and in 15 minutes they could be standing uh, at the entranceway to their property. In the lead up to the grand opening, Walmart was flying in here on average at least every other week, sometimes more often than that, and on the grand opening day, as I said, they flew in five jets for that event. This is huge for Paulding County, and this is representative to the kinds of things that having an, an airport in your community opens up to you. Conference space and events. We have one of the most beautiful conference buildings in the county. We uh, make that available to citizens and businesses. Um, we have two large conference rooms, one upstairs, one downstairs. The downstairs room is often used for very elegant um, settings, as you see here. This was, I believe, the Hiram uh, JROTC uh, annual military ball that they had at the airport. Uh, this is the upstairs room. We can configure this for various um, uses. Uh, this is set up as just a small training facility. Add a little food and any event goes better. We have a church now that's meeting at the airport, has over 100 members, so we have 100 folks coming to the airport uh, watching what we're up to every day or every Sunday um, as they come to, to worship in our facility. This is just a, a list of some of the types of events that we've held. Um, it, the ones I'm most proud of are the school events that we have. You see their school dances. Um, we have all kinds of training. Uh, just anything that you can imagine takes place there. And your event can be held here. If you call our office anytime during regular uh, business hours, we can make either of these rooms available. There's a small rental fee based on what the type of the business or the, the individual using it. Um, but county government, uh, first responders, aviation events, uh, educational events that are officially a part of the, uh, the Board of Education. These are all free. We make our spaces free to those folks who uh, need a place in the county to meet. Education. 
Uh, this was a picture taken the day of the high school STEM event. Uh, hundreds of high school students pass through on this day every year. And it's basically a job fair in the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics arena. Um, first responders, aviation uh, activities, all kinds of things uh, take place there. And they're given an opportunity to get hands-on and actually go out and touch and feel uh, things of a high-tech nature and understand what some of the career opportunities that are open to them are. We also had our week-long FAA STEM camp. These are some pictures that we took from that. Uh, these are 50 high school kids from the local area who were entertained to a week-long summer camp. Uh, they, were, uh, they were exposed to all aspects of aviation, from maintenance to flight to, um, to just anything that you can imagine related to aviation. And I think all of those kids had a really good time and a really good experience. That was the high school version of what the West Georgia Youth Science and Technology Center did the next week, which was kindergarten through elementary school. We had 50 kids come in for that. Now, this was last year's announcement. Notice at the bottom it says registration closed, camp is full. That was last year. There's a new camp scheduled for this, this summer. If you've got kids in either of these two age groups, high school kids or elementary school kids, we have a week-long camp for them and we would love for them to come participate. This is a picture of the, um, the young kids uh, experimenting with some, uh, some toys and things that introduced them to the concepts of math, science, technology, and engineering. Uh, this is just a list of educational events that we had during the year. The significant thing that I want to show you here is we start with preschool. We had things for elementary, for middle school, high school for uh, some of the local colleges, for the teachers themselves. Uh, the military ball is listed there. We even had the Dallas High School class reunion. Most people in here don't realize that there used to be a Dallas High School in Paulding County. I love this reunion because these folks are all over 60 and by nine o'clock they were home in bed asleep <laughs> and we could go home and lock up the building. So we're, we're opening this to the Dallas High School reunion every year. Military training. We are very proud to be able to offer uh, just an incredible asset for the military to come in and train at our airport. Um, these are some parachute, military parachute jumpers. Um, we have parachute jumps there about uh, once every other month or so, and they use our airfield for training because of the openness that is represented by, by our property there. This is a DC-3. Uh, that's actually still in service. This is dropping one of the elite um, uh, military parachute teams from 12,000 feet and above. So uh, some of these old planes are still flying. Okay, this is the V-22 Offspray, and the reason I put this picture up, uh, this is not Photoshop. You see the bolt of lightning that was captured in this uh, shot in the back, and I can tell you with scientific certainty that this is not Photoshopped, um, this is an actual bolt of lightning. How do I know this? Because the Georgia Tech Research Institute has uh, one of the North Georgia lightning array sensors now located at the Paulding County Airport, and I've got the data on this, um, this bolt of lightning, and we know, we know where it hit, uh, how big it was, those kinds of things. Uh, and I can tell you, if Dorothy had had this when The Wizard of Oz was filmed, then The, the Wizard of Oz would have been about a five-minute public service um, advertisement for how to quickly move into a storm shelter when the big storm is coming. That's what this research is all about, and the Paulding County Airport is a part of that. Political cooperation. So up until this year, when I had problems at the airport, I basically had to deal with contractors um, to come out and do things. Under the new intergovernmental agreement that we have, when I have an emergency arise at the airport, I can call Mr. Scott Green, Director of Operations. He can assess whether or not this is something that makes sense for the county to assist us with. In this particular picture, we had a sinkhole that came up around one of our uh, big storm drains. I called Scott. Within 30 minutes, he was there. He said, yep, we can help you. And he sent a, a crew out there. They dug out the, the uh, surrounding area, found out what the problem was, fixed it, repaired it, and we were back good to go, saving the county thousands of dollars in having to go uh, do this on a contract basis with the local contractor. Some other highlights of the new intergovernmental agreement, it's based on a two-year budget cycle. 
Uh, this was under the leadership of Mr. Frank Baker. He insisted that the airport be on the same financial footing that the other uh, departments in the county and that I have to come before you and, and defend our budget every two years. We support that. We think it's a good idea. And so we're, we're now in a much more fiscally responsible posture than we have been in the past. Um, all the land, oh, I skipped one. Uh, we now have a stable business model for airport sustainability. I'm very happy about that. Uh, we have been uh, struggling financially, primarily because of all the lawsuits that we've had since the beginning of the commercialization era. And we now have a sustainable business model that allows us to operate an airport and maintain it to the standards that the FAA expects. Uh, the next bullet, all land jointly um, held by the BOC and the PCAA. You will remember the ridiculous fight over the 163 acres uh, that we had over the recent past. Uh, so the better solution to that is we're going to put all property jointly in the name of the airport authority and the Paulding County Board of Commissioners. I now hold a letter from the FAA authorizing that transfer. We're ready to move forward uh, to go ahead and make that happen. We're very happy about that. Uh, we can't commit the county to any uh, financial obligation without a public vote from your board. So this, this ties us more closely together to make sure that as we go forward with enhancements, uh, modifications to the airport, if it's going to commit the county to anything beyond our, our regular uh, intergovernmental agreement that we already have in place, I have to come to you or my board has to come to you for permission. And as demonstrated by that, this $160,000 that I've already alluded to, that we were able to save because y'all turned us uh, into being able to access the full procurement system of Paulding County government. And we were able to go get a, a fully competitive bid on that uh, renovation of the Paulding uh, Airport hangar, the big hangar, and considerable cost savings for the airport. OK, looking ahead. Uh, this is one of the flying assets from the Museum of Flight. Uh, the Museum of Flight has now signed a contract that will bring uh, a new hangar uh, to, uh, to our campus. This is the architect's rendering. So this is, you know, this is preliminary, but this is about what we think this is going to look like. Those of you familiar with our terminal building, you'll see to the left of the terminal building at the edge of our existing parking lot is where we intend to put the Museum of Flight. The Museum of Flight will bring uh, opportunities uh, for uh, touching historical uh, artifacts that will allow kids in particular to, to remember what our past was all about. And we're very excited to have them a part of the family. Uh, this is the, uh, my famous dirt floor in the office building that was uh, a shell in 2015 and has set here uh, untouched for five years. And so this, uh, this week, yesterday, I was able to uh, put on the window the building permit that is now going to finally get this space built out. We have a signed contract with the museum to put them in a third of the building. Uh, one small space is going to be a 24-7 pilot's lounge so that our pilots flying in after hours will have a place where they can do flight planning, go to the restroom, get a pack of crackers, those kind of things. And then we've got about 2,000 square feet, which will be usable for just general business uh, there in this building. The floor above that, uh, I call it the grand ballroom. I have several ideas that we could use for this. We don't have funding to do anything with this space yet. Um, but some of the ideas that have been put forward is uh, possibly making this a grand ballroom. This is a uh, 5,600 square feet room. It would be one of the largest meeting rooms in Paulding County, roughly the same size as the space over at the Senior Center, and the only space of this type uh, west of the building that we're in right now. So this would bring convention capability to the western sector of Paulding County. Chattahoochee Tech, we know that they're planning to build an A&P school on our property. Uh, we work hard every day to try to uh, work through the bureaucratic processes of having that property released so that it can be sold to the state of Georgia. We're making good progress on that. We're not done yet, but that is moving forward. And then I saved one set of thank yous for the very end. You guys have just been amazing to work with this year. The things that you have just seen in this presentation would not have been possible without you. I'm, I'm excited to be able to stand before you 
and say that we've got some big things coming that we're excited about for 2020, uh, go Team Paulding. I'll be happy to answer any questions that y'all may have for me. So you don't like movies? What about this oh, movie? Oh, you want to see the movie. You heard, you heard there was a movie. So uh, we like to say Paulding County Airport is where business takes <laughs> off. Notice the eclipse of the sun. Do you have any idea how long you have to work with the sun to get it to cooperate on something like that? Um, business is taking off in Paulding County, and we think it starts at the Paulding County Airport. Any other questions that you've got for me? That's not what I was asking. Last full measure. Oh, last full measure. Oh, okay. So last full measure was actually not a 2019 event for us. It was filmed earlier than that, but it is now out. And if you go look at the trailer for last full measure, uh, if you look very carefully, you'll see the Paulding County Airport prominently displayed in the trailer. I've not yet seen the movie, but they spent a couple of weeks there filming. And several of the scenes uh, are filmed, uh, in particular the... Uh, scenes inside the hangar where they were having the ceremony in the movie. Samuel Jackson and some other uh, famous actors were there, and so Paulding County was prominently displayed. I can also tell you how season three of The Ozarks ends, but I'll keep that to myself. Thank you, Terry. Great report, great job. It's uh, just wonderful to have good relationships with the airport authority. Thank you all very much. Terry, I just want to say thank you for all you've done. It's been a great year working with you guys, and um, I want to thank Brian for all of the help, along with Frank, Chuck, and Ron, and Dave. Um, I can't wait to see what this year is going to hold out there. Me too. Thank you all. Terry, have you announced the dates for the STEM camps for the uh, 2020? Yolanda, have you got those? June 8th through the 12th. Now, that's the high school STEM. What about the junior high? The junior or the um, Elementary school? June 22nd for so the elementary school. So we got dates in June. I can speak firsthand to the, um, at least the high school one. I had a son who was 15 last year. He's 16 now, and by the end of 2020, he should have his private license. Awesome. So he's excited about aviation, and that camp was a big part of that. So anybody watching this, if you, uh, if you have a high schooler, send them out there. It's a fun week, and um, they feed them well, and they get to do a lot of cool <laughs> stuff. So the, our kids enjoyed it. Thank you. Terry, I do appreciate you too. And if Julie comes up and asks you about the end of season three with the Ozarks, please don't tell her. Okay. She'll look good. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Thank you. We have no bit awards this morning. Uh, first report from uh, committee or department is from Ms. Mary Carol Sheffield from the Extension Department. And Mary Carol, always great to hear from you, and you do a great job. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to come forward, and I, um, I left a little annual report for everybody. There's extra copies in the back of the room if anybody else is interested in the annual report from Extension for 2019. Um, first off, I want to thank you for the wonderful job that the county did renovating our building early in the year. We moved out and back in in a matter of short order, and the building's in um, great shape on the inside. <laughs> and the outside's going to be on great shape. If you come visit anytime soon, bring your muck boots and call us beforehand to find out where to park. But it, it's going well, and we are really grateful for all of that. So thank you. Um, we wanted to highlight a few of the things that have happened this year that are uh, we're super proud of. Um, we have a new 4-H agent, Josie Davis, who started a little over a year ago, and she's done a great job taking on our 4-H program. It's a very active 4-H program. It's had a lot of success in the past, and she continues that legacy. Um, one of the things that she did is she's worked really hard to maintain and increase the number of donations and grants that fund the outreach and the impact that we can have with our Paulding County youth. And she's raised almost $12,000 in um, 2019 to support uh, $2,500 in camp scholarships for 16 first-time campers to help us get 79 kids to public speaking contest. Um, the older kids spend a whole weekend at Rock Eagle, and it is free to them if they are willing to go and do the public speaking contest. Public speaking is scary. So these young people um, have a lot to be proud of, and we are super proud of them. Of our, our students, we have several really great leadership examples in our 4-Hers this year. One of our students was elected by um, her peers in all 159 counties to serve on the 4-H state board. 
And she's been doing that proudly for the year. She's represented Paulding County well around our state. We have another student who was uh, elected by students, 4-Hers from 39 counties in our Northwest District to serve on the district board. So we have great kids in leadership in our county. We had one student who mastered at State Congress in their public speaking contest. And we also have three talented 4-Hers who are um, members of the cast of Clovers and Company, which is a performing arts group at the state level. So if you are interested in performing arts and you've never seen Clovers and Company perform, you can Google them or check them out on YouTube. It's pretty impressive. And, and three of those kids are our own Paulding County 4-Hers. Um, those are some of the major highlights for 4-H. For Ag and Natural Resources, we had a great year, and I always like to attribute a lot of our success to my fantastic volunteers, and several of them are here today. Um, Master Gardener volunteers gave more than 2,000 hours of volunteer service this year, and that's at a value of more than $50,000 to the county. It's like having an extra full-time employee that I don't have to pay for. They do excellent outreach in our community, help people with um, gardening education, to help people improve soil and water quality. And they also raise money every year at a plant sale. And for the last 11 years, they've given a $1,000 scholarship to a local high school student who's going away to technical school or college. Um, they continue that legacy this year. So over that last 11 years, they've given away more than $11,000 of the money that they've earned. Um, super proud of all the work that they've done and again grateful for the support that you offer it is a collaboration between the university of georgia and the county and you all have been so supportive and we're so thankful if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them how's the bb gun team doing they're doing great they're having a great year and they're getting ready to set off to competitions and hopefully we'll have a team going to rogers arkansas for the daisy nationals in july so Great job, Mary Carol. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Under the consent agenda, consideration of these following items, uh, enumerated number two, uh, adopt the water system job classifications for a maintenance team leader, and number two, a maintenance mechanic. Um, the, uh, the next one is to approve a memorandum of understanding slash uh, indefeasible right of use with Greystone Power to provide access to fiber between the water treatment plant and the administrative building. Enumerated number four is to authorize Parker Fiber to make connections to Greystone Power's fiber uh, with a not to exceed amount of $50,000. And number five is declare items listed as surplus and approve their disposal through action or trade uh, it's from the, the <coughs> vehicle is from the Environmental Health Department, Unit 350, a 1999 Ford Ranger. Uh, serial number 1FTYR10C0XPB97620. Uh, Would any of the commissioners like to place any of the consent agenda items on the regular business? Hearing none. Under old business, we have none. Moving into new business is discuss uh, action to adopt resolution 20-03, approving property exchange and the granting and accepting of easements with, uh, with Nature Walk Development Company Incorporated and authorizing the settlement and release of the claims. This will be reported on by our county attorney, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Chairman, this is a, this is a been going on for about three years now. So what we call a statutory land exchange. Uh, the background of this is that back in the early part of 2017, the county uh, had a need to expand the buffer inside the existing landfill uh, up on Ivy Gulledge or up on Gulledge Road. When you do a statutory land exchange, it authorizes a government to exchange property with a private landowner as long as certified appraisals which come from that show that what the county is receiving is worth and value at least equal to what it's giving up or what it's receiving is perhaps worth more than what it's giving up. In early 2017, because of some deed title issues, this exchange, while approved here, did not go forward and back, I believe, in late 2018, the motion approving the exchange was rescinded. Following that time, 
because of some of the efforts that Nature Walk Development had engaged in anticipating approval and completion of this exchange, uh, the county was served with an ante litem notice for claims of uh, lost opportunities, some expenses that Nature Walk had made. Those claims against the county uh, listed in the ante litem notice uh, were in excess of $350,000. This exchange, this resolution that is before you here, resolves those claims and approves and, and completes authorization for the exchange. So what will happen upon your approval, there will be a 17-acre piece of property that the, county, that the county acquires from Nature Walk. In exchange, the county will convey to Nature Walk a 17-acre parcel of property, which is raw land which has not been developed. Additionally, the county is going to convey three easements to Nature Walk. One of those is a limited access easement for emergency purposes and for construction access purposes. Two of the other easements are what we call recreational path slash utility easements. I believe that Nature Walk intends to construct uh, cart paths for the citizens that live in that section of Nature Walk in the Seven Hills area. Nature Walk will also be conveying to Paulding County a utility and ingress egress easement. Rather than the $350,000 plus settlement, uh, the tentatively agreed upon settlement is for $50,000 and for a release of all claims uh, brought by Nature Walk pertaining to this exchange. That is, in sum, the primary elements of the, uh, of the settlement agreement. Glad to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Jason. Now, the next new business item would be number seven, but uh, I have overlooked uh, a category of on the agenda, which is public participation on agenda items. And uh, this person and leader in our county uh, wanted to speak on the next item, which is number seven. That would be Mr. Tom Morris. Uh, to speak on uh, the ordinance 20-01. Sorry to skip over you there, Tom. It's okay. I've been skipped over before. <laughs> it's good to see you this morning, Commissioners. I want to uh, speak on this ordinance, and I want everyone to understand that my comments are really designed to find a better way to address this particular ordinance. I have some questions and concerns about what is going to be proposed to you today, about moving this ordinance more to a state code rather than the county code we have now. <clears throat> I learned about last month, I learned that probably the marshal service would be asking you to change this ordinance to go with the state codes rather than the county codes you have now. And I hope that my comments today will move us in that direction where we can find a better answer to what is in the current county code. I did a lot of research over the weekend about state codes. And after looking at those state codes, I got very concerned that actually if you just go in and, and ad adopt the state codes, you might actually put more work on law enforcement here in this county rather than less. And the reason I say that is when you look at what the state code has to say, it talks about vehicles can be parked. It doesn't say how large or how small or anything else, but vehicles can be parked if the right front wheels are within 12 inches of the curb. That's what it says. And if they're on the other side of the road, it can be the left front wheels. But, so I think that when you have, if you have something like that in the code for Paulden County, you're going to have a lot more people parking on the subdivision streets. If it's not in a subdivision, the wheels are supposed to be on the edge of the paved section. But I think it may generate more work for the Marshals Bureau and for the Sheriff's Office. So my que I have some questions here, and I'm sure that Chief Hess will respond to a lot of these when he does his presentation, but will they be adopting, are they proposing to adopt all sections of the Georgia Universal uh, Code about roads? Uh, like I said, I think it will lead to more work for them. Uh, one section, I've already mentioned about the 12 inches, but what happens if you've got two, two vehicles parked on a subdivision street? They're going in different directions. They're both parked 12 inches from the curb. And believe me, I tried going through something like that in a subdivision before. You're very limited in getting through 
that section that, that section of the road I worry about school buses emergency vehicles coming through there and so I just wonder if this part of the state code would not be bad for the county it also has uh, one of the things that I'm real concerned about is safety of the children in the subdivisions or anywhere in, in the county if you have a lot more cars parked on the streets how many of us have seen a child dash out from in front of a car parked car or behind a parked car and if the visibility is less because of the car being parked there or a big van or campers we've seen on some of our streets the driver has less time to react to a child dashing out in the road and I may be wrong but I'm just convinced that we'll see more parking on our county roads especially in the subdivisions if we go with the state code we also have problems with some vehicles being parked on sidewalks and I know this is not something that's been enforced in the past about vehicles being parked on sidewalks. I've seen children have to walk out in the street because they can't get up the sidewalk to go to a bus stop. I've had to walk out in the street because I couldn't use the sidewalk. This presents a danger, not only to children, but everyone, if the sidewalks are blocked. And my question is, the state code requires that sidewalks not be blocked that cars not be parked or vehicles not be parked on sidewalks so i hope that that's something that would be in involved in any code that we have here whether it's the state code or you reversing in some ways the county code and i'm sure that chief has will have some reasons to go ahead and and for you to to uh, look at this today and, and approve this today I think it's premature I think we really need to take a closer look at all the answer or all the questions and, and some of the answers we might come up with to make it better for law enforcement in this county and my recommendation to you is to table this proposal for today and just set a time for uh, a group to come back to you and, and what I suggest uh, for your consideration is that you look at someone from law enforcement from the uh, uh, county school system uh, from a resident from each uh, designated by each commissioner uh, the fire department and then just look at this in total how will this affect uh, first responders how will this affect residents will it generate more parking in, in subdivisions and then come back to this board you could set a time next meeting two meetings from now whatever so I'm not talking about a long period of time but let's just step back and look at this some of the topics I've listed and uh, for discussion for this group if you decide to go in this way um, I know the Marshalls Bureau has a tough time dealing with complaints about parking uh, one minute I have two, make a motion may I have two minutes please motion to extend by two minutes we got a motion is there a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. please continue thank you I'll hurry through uh, I know one of the problems they have is they they can go out and there might be a birthday party or some other party going on in the neighborhood and they have no leeway based on the county code right now they have to write a ticket if cars are parked in the street that's something that needs to be looked at <coughs> the real critical time here to me is from seven o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the afternoon when kids are going to school when school buses are coming in making sure that cars and larger vehicles are not parked on the streets so I, I would hope that that would be something we could look at one of the things I picked up in looking at other counties uh, Carroll County has a code enforcement officer I've been a believer along in a long time that we could have code enforcement officers who are not certified law enforcement but working in the Marshals Bureau or somewhere in the county and then turning things over to law enforcement when needed so I would hope that you would look at something like that Cobb County has two public ordinances or two public uh, hearings a year on any changes in ordinances and I would really like to see if we're gonna have any changes in this parking in the county that we have a public hearing on this because it's gonna affect a lot of people throughout the county and just to get the citizen input and look together of how we can make a better uh, system and, and ordinance here in the county for parking thank you very much thank you mr. Morris for your input and your concern so the next new business item is chief Hess uh, discussing the action uh, to adopt ordinance 20-01 
an ordinance amending section 62-63 ABC regarding the unlawful use of a county road. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see y'all. Um, I want to thank Tom. We've always had a great uh, relationship with working with Tom through our Marshals Bureau. So hopefully I can alleviate some of his concerns. Um, <clears throat> this revision would be a continuance of our ongoing review process of the county ordinances that we're currently doing. Um, that those ordinances that need updated and or revised for clarification. This particular ordinance was enacted in 1998, so that kind of tells you how old it is. Uh, we wanted to look at that, and that being said, this revision will get us up to speed with surrounding counties, but it will still protect the integrity of our roadways as it was designed to do. Um, examples, just as, as Tom had, had, had touched on, uh, we have citizens that right now, if they want to have a birthday party or a family gathering or Christmas folks over, um, they just are subject to getting a citation if they're parked on the roadway. And as we all know, a lot of these driveways, they just can't handle more than four or five cars. Um, as far as the state law is concerned and some of Tom's concern about emergency vehicles, um, I think he mentioned the fact that two cars could be parked parallel. Uh, state law actually does prohibit that, and that's what we would be uh, enforcing along with the help from the sheriff's office. Um, I think another one of his concerns was the fact that school buses couldn't get through. Once again, the parallel, uh, it would alleviate that. Um, as far as creating more work from the Marshals Bureau, I can assure you <laughs> no law enforcement agency is going to do anything that's going to create more work for us. I mean, it's just not something we want to do. We want to be able to remove some of these things that we're doing that that we can enforce through state law and that we can move forward with things like litter and cleaning up the county um, and i believe we can work work on this and get it get it punched through so we can do that um, so that being said I'm, I'm open for any questions mr chair if i can add just one comment for the questions just so the board is clear, the state laws regarding parking set out in Title 40 of the Georgia Code, those are actually already in effect. We're, it's not a situation where we would opt in or select to have those in place. Those are the laws of the land in Georgia already. Um, if the marshal's office isn't gonna take care of this any longer, who is going to be responsible well now we will still be responding if somebody has a parking complaint to come out and look at it because we never know exactly what we may have it's kind of like you know somebody calls in a you know a, a civil dispute well it may be something different if somebody calls in a parking violation it may be actually that they're storing the vehicle in the roadway and it's a junk vehicle mm -hmm. so we still need to respond to our citizens and help them out with that and determine what we actually have so we, we will still be responding. Thank you. It's a tough problem, isn't it? You know, you yeah, <laughs> it, it is, but I think it's something that we've looked at for a long time, and, and uh, with the help of our county attorney, um, I appreciate all his help with this. So. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Number eight is discuss action to approve the awarding of a contract with Musco Lighting at a price not to exceed $177,500 for the lighting of the multi-purpose field at Burn Hickory Park. And this will be funded through SPLOST. Mr. Justice is already here. Did you sprint up here? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Since the uh, initial construction at Burn Hickory, we have added a, an additional multi-purpose field. Um, we refer to those fields as rectangles or diamonds, you know, depending on what activity there is there. This is a rectangular shaped field. Uh, when we did that construction, we did not have the funding to uh, install the lighting, uh, which you can imagine has severely limited the amount of use that we can get out of it during certain times of the year. The lighting system out there now is a must-go system. Uh, Musco is a part of a national co-op uh, called Sourcewell. It's 
It's very similar to state contracts. All the uh, different types of projects and materials are already vetted. Uh, we are a member as a county of that co-op. Uh, which allows us to, to preclude the bid process with this. Since the initial system is must go, we'd like to go back with the same one. And this is LED lighting. It comes with a uh, rather extensive warranty that's um, up, up to 25 years, uh, even for, for bulb replacement. So with your approval, we'd like to uh, get started with lighting that field up down there. Any questions, concerns? Sounds good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Number nine is discuss action to approve a non-compensatory contract extension on the phase two finished water transmission main project for Garney Construction. Ms. Ashmore, or we're going to have Mr. Com Comstock. Yep. Thanks for being here, Kelly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, before that agenda item, I just wanted to give you a brief update on a milestone that we hit with uh, the Richland Creek uh, Water Supply Program. Um, if you recall, sort of our critical path was getting the pump station at the river uh, ready to pump, and we did achieve that last week, so that, that's a positive thing. Um, sorry to say that our, our scheduled inspection of the dam with safe dams did not take place as originally intended. Um, it was scheduled for the 15th of January, and because of the rain event during that period, they, they were not able to come out. So we've rescheduled that for next week, and so we're optimistic that um, they're going to come out. Uh, we're going we're to pass that inspection, and then we'll be able to start uh, the filling process and pumping water into the reservoir. Um, this particular item is associated with the finished water pipeline, uh, which is the, the line that comes uh, from Walden Place down here to the booster pump station uh, that's being con constructed um, behind this complex. And um, Garney Construction is the contractor associated with this. They um, essentially had three different elements during the construction um, that caused them additional time. One was the amount of rain that occurred uh, exceeded what was uh, shown within the contract in terms of number of rain days. Um, the, the second area was a very difficult um, crossing of West Memorial. They were tunneling that, that section um, underneath West Memorial, and it was a combination of very hard rock and then also two-phase rock that made them take a lot longer. They had to do some um, actual hard rock boring, but then they had to switch to actual hand mining for part of that crossing. So it took them a significantly uh, longer period of time than anticipated. And the third area is the booster pump station. When they actually came and did the excavation to start uh, the sub work underneath that structure, we determined that the groundwater surface was much higher than uh, previously measured and anticipated. So we had to make some adjustments to the um, the pipe chase that goes underneath that structure and, and do some redesign. And so that, that slowed down that process. The good thing is um, Garney has been doing an excellent job. Um, and this, all of this work, although it impacts their schedule in one way or another, um, it's being done within their current contract in terms of cost. Um, so there's no um, cost change associated with any of these um, items. And these items don't impact the anticipated schedule for being able to convey water um, to the residents of Paulding County. Um, so this, this component is not impacting any of the other programs. We have to fill up the reservoir get that to a level to be able to bring water into the plant start the plant up before we can start conveying water down to this to this location so um, this adjustment in their contract time does not uh, prevent us from providing water to Paulding County um, as as planned out in the overall schedule and as I said it's a non-compensatory uh, time change so they're not looking for any additional cost uh, associated with the with the additional time it's just a granting of time and this extends their their contract till April 13 um, their current schedule has them completed actually in the March time frame so uh, we anticipate being finished prior to prior to what they're asking for here so with that I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have with the delay in the um, safe dams group coming out that that will definitely extend being able to use the water yeah so so with uh, like, like I said, right now we're assuming things are going to go well with safe dams. If we get the green light um, next week, then we'll be able to start the filling process. Um, we'll be able to fill the first 
third of the reservoir very quickly. Um, and then for the second third, we have to do uh, two, two foot per week uh, maximum. And at that point, it's really going to be looking at the water quality. We don't, we want to make sure that that stabilizes because you're bringing in water. You want to make sure that uh, the water quality is stable before you start the treating treatment process. Because once we start the plant up, we don't want to have to shut it down. We want to actually, you know, produce the water and, and start the conveyance. So, so we're working through that whole time frame, but it's all really contingent upon what the water quality looks like and it's contingent upon us uh, passing the safe dams inspection um, and so we're, we're looking at the March April time frame for starting the plant up and um, and and working through all the startup associated with the plant and then sometime after that actually sending water to the distribution system Commissioner Hart volunteered to uh, taste the water and check <laughs> yeah, <it. that's laughs> I did want to just add that there is a period of time in here where we'll be treating water but not releasing it to the distribution system. In addition to the testing of the systems that Kelly was mentioning, we have a regulatory requirement uh, for a 30-day test period where the state will be monitoring the treatment process along with us before they will allow us to put it out in the distribution system. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next three and the last three are going to be called the Mr. Jones Show here. I'll just read one at a time, and George, you can respond one at a time. Number 10 is discuss action to approve the chairman to enter into an agreement with Kelly Landscapes Management, Inc., for the roadside right-of-way turf maintenance services contract in the amount of $168,615.40. The contract provides for finished mowing, string trimming, edging, and litter pickup of approximately 66 acres. That's 10 and a half acres of median and 55.44 acres of roadside shoulders on various county roads. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Like I said, Chairman, this item is for the actually the first renewal of a contract with Kelly Landscaping Services, originally approved by the Board of Commissioners on the March 26, 2019 board meeting. Uh, the contract provides for services for, for providing uh, right-of-way turf maintenance for grass medians and grass shoulders on various county-owned and maintained roadways. You know, the county has installed grass on a, some of our DOT projects, and we desire to keep the sod healthy, weed-free, and viable to um, enhance and maximize the aesthetic benefits of this investment. As you said, the contract provides for 66 acres of turf, grass, median shoulders for finished mowing, stream trimming, edging, and litter pickup. Also included are three cycles of fertilizer and herbicide. Um, the cost for the budgeted work for all these quantities is $168,615.40. The work is to start in mid-March and goes through the end of October, a total of 17 cycles. You know, Kelly Landscaping Services has performed these turf maintenance services for us for over the past four years, and um, we've been pretty happy with their work so far. The current contract that y'all approved in 2019 had the provision to be extended up to two years, provided we and Kelly were satisfied and agreed. And um, we, we would like to pursue this, and Kelly has indicated their uh, willingness to pursue this contract for this year also. So um, I could answer any questions if you have any. Okay, seeing none, uh, number 11 is discuss action to approve the chairman to enter into an agreement with the Yellowstone Landscape for the fiscal year 2020 countywide shoulder maintenance services contract in the amount of $872,313. The contract provides multiple cycles for mowing, trimming, and litter pickup on 523 miles of county roads and 21 miles of four-lane state highways. Again, this is item is for the first renewal of a contract with Yellowstone Landscape that was approved by the board at the May 14th, 2019 board meeting. The contract, this one is for a one-year contract for performing right-of-way shoulder maintenance services for the county, which includes mowing and litter pickup. The 2019 contract like it did include the option for renewal period for up to two years at the discretion of the county in the agreement of the contractor. As you said, um, we're providing for mowing, trimming, and litter pickup for 523 miles of county roads and 21 miles of four-lane state-divided highways. The mowing and trimming on the county roads will be performed up to four times per year 
mowing, trimming, and litter pickup on the state. Um, highways, state four lane divided, will be performed up to three times per year. The contract also has a provision to fund up to five cycles of winter off season, off growing season, litter pickup, three cycles on the state divided highways, Highway 120, Highway 278, and two cycles on the county roadways. The first round of mowing will begin in April 2020 if this is approved. Um, the cities of Dallas and Hiram participated in the last contract. Dallas um, for their portion of 278 within their city limits and Hiram um, their portion of US 278 in their city limits and their portion of Nebo Road. As you said, the cost of this work for all budgeted items is $872,313.00. Um, last year was the first year we used Yellowstone landscaping. We're um, satisfied with the work, especially towards the end of the year once they got to know the county, our expectations, and we recommend going forward with this contract. And um, if you have any questions, I can answer them. Would you comment, please, on coordination with the uh, detained convicts or and, and how that blends in with these two contracts okay again you know we we work with GDOT the like I said the Sheriff's Department attention crew we try to you know this this road this contract is set up for the four lane divided and uh, basically 520 miles of you know um, county divided roadway so obviously um, these are going to be scheduled items throughout the year the first one will be in April the last one will probably be in October. We'll do another cycle probably sometime in June and sometime in August. So, again, I think we have the latitude. You know, we communicate with GDOT and the Sheriff's Department to make sure that the roads are getting cleaned uh, where they need to be. So, we do coordinate with our partners. <coughs> and finally, no, number 12 is discuss action authorize the chairman to enter into a contract with Southeastern Engineers in the amount of $98,500.99 for the preliminary engineering design services for the Ridge Road widening project from State Route 92 to Laird Road. Again, uh, Ridge Road is a you know two-lane minor arterial roadway located in Post 2 and Post 3 in south part of the county, which connects um, Highway 92 and Highway 61. This section of Ridge Road between 92 and Laird Road has approximately 8,000 cars per day, vehicles per day in this area right now. You know, Ridge Road in this area bunts the frontage of the um, new Greystone Power Corporation headquarters that is being constructed now. There are several other parcels along this corridor in this area that have commercial zoning, and we expect this area to experience significant growth, particularly once the Highway 92 project is completed, which I believe has a schedule of July of 2022. You know, traffic projections for Ridge Road indicate that it will not operate acceptably in the future, particularly once the four-lane widening of, or it's actually in that area, six-lane of Ridge Road is completed. You're going to have long queues of traffic um, on Ridge trying to get onto 92. The uh, storage lanes are not adequate to handle that traffic. You know, we believe it's in our best interest to get ahead of the growth and provide a corridor with sufficient lane lengths and proper access management to handle the current and existing traffic. You know, Southeastern has submitted a design proposal for a four-lane section along this part of um, Ridge Road, which is approximately 0.77 miles, for a cost of $98,500.99. Um, this section of road is actually located in Post 3. So, um, that's what I have, and if you have any questions, I can answer them. Any questions for our DOT director? Thanks much, George. Thank you. <coughs> that is the conclusion of our regular business. Uh, no one has signed up uh, for public participation on non-agenda items. And we've uh, added in 2020 kind of a comment section where any of the commissioners could um, make an announcement about something or whatever so we'll start with number one I'm good thank you Dave thumbs up <laughs> okay well uh, remember prayer in the park at uh, one o'clock if you're available and uh, we do have requirement to go into executive session for real estate pending and potential litigation uh, I'll need a motion for that I'll make that motion Dave. a motion by Commissioner Davis you're hard to beat you know 
Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Caker. All those in favor say aye. 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 We stand adjourned for executive session.